reading of the Gospel. Our Gospel today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. In it, Jesus is tempted by the devil. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit for 40 days into the wilderness, tempted by the devil. And Jesus ate nothing in those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to Jesus, If you are the child of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, One shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it shall be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, You shall worship the sovereign, your God, and God only shall you serve. And the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, if you are the child of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, God will give angels charge of you to guard you, and on the other hand, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus replied, It is said, You shall not tempt the sovereign your God. And the devil, had, having ended every temptation, departed from Jesus until an opportune time. May God add understanding to the reading of this gospel. Glory be to the Maker, and to the Christ, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the with Satan. The devil and Jesus are speaking to each other. That's kind of hard to imagine because we expect Jesus to be in communication with God. As we read the Gospels, time after time we find Jesus in prayer. Jesus was in constant conversation with God. But in the scripture text for today, we find a different kind of conversation going on. Jesus was being tempted. He struggled over how to live his life and how to do his ministry. And Satan tried to draw Jesus away from God's good plan for salvation. Satan offered Jesus easier options than death on a cross. Often the most powerful temptations are the most subtle ones. Blatant sin is easy to spot and a whole lot easier to avoid. But the sin that's really hard to resist is the sin for a good cause. Good causes have justified a multitude of evils in society. When Satan came to Jesus, he didn't try to get him to steal or kill or lie. He simply tried to get Jesus to pursue the same mission, but by using other means than God's means. I think sometimes we all do that. 
Sometimes we try to outthink God. We ignore God's guidelines and instead devise our own plans for life. We create God's will for our own clever techniques. After all, most of us can be clever at times, can't we? We may try to pursue a good goal, but not by God's method. That is the kind of temptation that Jesus faced when in his conversation with the devil. What are our, what are our temptations today? Think about that for a moment. The devil led Jesus up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, it says. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it's been given to me to give over to whoever I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. I have a wonderful story. I've been running across these wonderful stories here lately, I tell you. Google is a good thing, I can tell you that, okay? A group of concerned Christians from all over the city had gathered together. It wasn't a very large group, but they were committed, and they knew that representing, and they knew they represented the feeling of a lot more people. A congressman was speaking to them, and he was very intense. I think you can relate to this. The men and women in this group were nodding in agreement. No occasion. As the congressman spoke, you could hear an amen from the group. He said, we can take America back. Pornography, illegal drugs, the breakdowns of the family, gays, divorced people, people that are different from us, are undermining the moral fiber of this country. We can't just stand around and do nothing. It's time that we get tough. We need stricter law enforcement, longer prison sentences, capital punishment for more crimes. The country needs to promote righteousness. Prayer and Bible reading should be part of every public school room's activities. It's time for church leaders and politicians to team up to make America Christian again. The group just burst into applause. Yay! But not long after the meeting had ended, a woman approached the smiling congressman because he was very proud that he'd gotten applause about everything he said. And she said, I agree a lot with what you said, but I still have some serious questions. You talked a lot about getting tough on crime, but not much about getting tender with the needy. What about the homeless? What about the hungry? His mom had almost disappeared. She continued, and I'm not sure churches should depend on the government to promote our faith. We shouldn't look to the government to step in. We don't need a government handout to do our work. Righteousness is not something you impose. It's something that God inspires in us. The congressman, not smiling anymore, said, Look, lady, politicians like me are doing Christians a big favor. What the churches can't do by persuasion, we can do by passing laws. What you can't do with a gentle word, we can do with the power to prosecute people. I think it would be smart for you people to team up with folks in high places. Can we relate to that? And Jesus said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only God. Exactly what is temptation? The devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and saying to him, if you really are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. There was once a church, one of the largest in the state, it may have been Texas, but in the past 20 years it had been in decline. The population of the entire region was smaller than it once was. Several large factories had closed and people had moved elsewhere to find jobs. There was a shift in the population and the membership had gone way down. Something had to be done. The chairman of the board of the church said his brother's church hired a firm that did wonders for the growth of their congregation. The board agreed to call the outfit and see if they could do the same for their church. So a church growth expert came, and I'm sure there was a charge for that. He came from Growing Churches Advertising Incorporated. And his presentation was very powerful. He said, if your church wants to soar with the eagles, Rather than waddle with the ducks, 
You have to try to do things that no one else has ever done. You have to set yourself apart. You have to get noticed. In our day and age, you have to grab the public's attention. Heads nodded in agreement all over the room. People were smiling. They were thinking about, ooh, better days are coming. The expert continued, you have to make the public know you're not a run-of-the-mill congregation. He says, over in another place where we work, there's a church that has been growing in leaps and bounds. Since the church began to sponsor an annual Christian Bodybuilders contest, they promote themselves as the Hard Body Church, the healthiest congregation in town. And the Sunday before the contest, the minister takes his shirt, shirt off to give his sermon. Some of the smiles disappeared in the room. Some of them, their mouths got open like, huh? Now, I know you all don't want us to do that here. You don't want me taking my shirt off the preach. One older person in the congregation raised his hand and spoke. He said, I recall Jesus once said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed or like leaven in bread dough. It grows, but it's not seen. The consultant swept aside the comment. He said, that was a long time ago. Things have changed. You have to face up to the competition. My motto is, do whatever it takes. You have something to do, then make it a big deal. Something people can't ignore. For instance, since you want to project an image as a vital, cutting-edge church in this community, I propose you start a group called Bungee Jumpers for Jesus. He said, you can even have a good motto. You can have this motto that I came up with. The motto will be, we have a faith that always bounces back. That's kind of cute, isn't it? But Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It may not be the easiest way, but I think it may be the best way to serve God is to just follow the teachings of Christ. The best way to bring people to God is by our example. Living lives by following the example of Christ. The best way to attract people to church is by the peace that God blesses us with in our hearts. Sometimes the best way is not the most exciting way. Maybe the best way is telling your tax consultant about the church. Maybe the best way is when you're getting your hair done, getting pretty color put on it. Or David. Whatever. <laughs> You could say, you know, I was at church last Sunday, and it was really good. You, know, you might even, if I ever say something intelligent, you might say, the pastor even said, and I really liked that. It helped me. Or I enjoy going to be with my faith community. It might gives me a recharge for the week. We should be seen because of what we do and say, not because of the neon signs. We should be seen for our love and our grace, our forgiveness, our compassion, and our work. All given silently. Not with a finger pointing toward us, but with a finger pointing toward God. So let our journey be a good one. We will have to, individually and as a faith community, adjust our direction as we need to as we walk along. As long as we're always going forward toward the light of God, God will be with us. It's in the name of Christ I pray this day. Amen. Amen.